Genesis 1, verse 16, it says this, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Last five words of that says, He made the stars also. He made the stars also. Micah 7, verse 8. Micah 7, verse 8. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I want to just give just give you a word this morning from the thought, if God be for me. I believe God takes care of our health, but that doesn't mean we walk out in front of semi-trucks. Amen? Don't tempt God is what the Bible says. So it's still your responsibility to stand up for righteousness. And listen, I don't think there's a bunch of righteous people out there running for political office. I don't. I'm telling you right now, I do not believe for, for, for the most part, most of these guys are in it for themselves. Are you with me? Yes, I believe that. However, you need to, to be able to distinguish between the personality and the flaws of a human being and the policies that are biblical that get instituted by those people. I heard a guy this last week talking about how evil the Republican Party was and it was just godless, and I'm sitting there thinking, you're out of your mind, dude. Who you, what are you talking about? There's all kinds of godless people in it. Amen? But pro-life is pro-Bible. Pro-traditional family. What are you talking about traditional family? I'm talking about the one that God instituted in in Genesis 1. That's what I'm talking about, that a man shall leave his father and his mother and cling unto his wife, not his husband. That is a pro-biblical agenda. People who will stand up for Israel, that is a pro-biblical agenda. Are you listening? So it matters. Amen? Now listen, I'm telling you right now, we ain't got a Savior that's ever going to go to the White House. So if you're thinking that, listen, I'm, I'm a Trump fan. I happen to like the economy I lived under when he was here. I really like the fact that he moved the embassy to Jerusalem where it belonged. I liked a lot of things he did. I like the fact that the Supreme Court justices have overturned Roe v. Wade. And if you're so, listen, if you would ruin a nation over your, quote, reproductive health, then something's wrong with you. You better listen to what I'm telling you. Because the Bible says God hates those that shed innocent blood. Are you with me? That's tough, but it's real. Amen? So there's going to be political upheaval, but let me tell you something. It's more than that. There's something, and, I, and, and Karen, with God's help, next week, Karen will share her testimony, and she'll tell you what I'm talking about. But a year ago on November 7th, my world changed, and so did hers. Are you listening? And I mean change drastically. It has been a fight and a battle ever since that time, November 7th, 2022. I'm telling you that it has been a, 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 I don't know how to say it, the hardest battle I've ever fought. And honey, I've fought some doozies. You listen. It has been the hardest time. And, and what's amazing is that the year 2023, the church grew, finances grew, things got better after COVID, but it was still a battle. Are you listening? And not just a battle there, and Karen will share, share some of that with you, but since in that period of time, and, and I've, been, I've been very transparent and open, about six weeks ago, the enemy attacked my health. That attack has still been going on. I'm going to tell you something that happened on Wednesday morning, and I'm going to give you a testimony of a blessing, but I'm going to tell you this is serious. There's warfare going on because the devil is afraid of what God is about to do in in this house, through these people, through this leadership, through what God wants done, the enemy's mad. Well, I don't know what you get so excited about. I'll tell you what I get excited. How do you sit there like a lump on the log when you know that the God of glory is in the house? I don't understand it. How do you just go through the motion when you understand that the King of kings and the Lord of lords is riding through the house, that the Holy Ghost is moving in a powerful way? Well, I don't know. I'm just not emotional. Oh, man, you are too. There's not a single one of you ain't bald over something stupid. 
Watch grown men and women cry over a cat or a dog and won't say nothing about Jesus in the house of God. I'm not emotional. Lose your crap over a dead cat. Everything, everybody's got something that moves them. Jesus ought to move you. Just hang on, it'll get better. <clears throat> now watch. So on Sunday, I felt this urgency, and it was a spiritual battle, and, and, and you, I'm sure you heard me, and I just really urge you, listen, get serious about God. Don't play games. Get serious about your worship about how you speak, get serious about it. You can't just sit back and let the world pass you by. It's not what God intended for you. I just read it to you. He predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son. Have you read your Bible? Do you know what his son did? Do you know what it looked like? He said, greater things than these shall you do in my name. Amen? We ain't even doing comparable things, let alone greater things. Now you listen, I'm not trying to be hard on you. I'm telling you the truth. Amen? But I believe with all of my heart that day's coming. Amen? That day is coming. There is going to be a fight to get there. There's not any other way to do this. I'm telling you, the enemy won't allow the kingdom to just roll over top of him without at least fighting back. The good news is, he never wins. Amen? Now watch. <clears throat> Wednesday morning at 1 o'clock, I woke up, and I've shared with you the acid reflux thing or whatever, and I've been... I, I give God all the glory. I've had a lot of be, much better days. At the same time, it's still a battle. One, I'm going to win, by the way, just because God's going to win. <laughs> but about 1 o'clock, I woke up, and I had a pain running from here all the way down to my elbow, just, I mean, pain, chest pains, pain in my arm. I've never had an EKG. I've never been in the hospital. I've never had anything done on my heart. I, I've never ran on a treadmill. I don't know I, I, anything other than just the fact that God's kept me all these years. I don't know anything about, quote, the condition of my heart. Are you listening? So I wake up, and uh, I go go out and do what I do. I go out in the living room, and I just walk back and forth, and I prayed in tongues, and I prayed, to God, and I prayed for about an hour and a half, and the pain subsided. I went back to bed, and I slept for about four hours, and it woke me up again, and it was hurting again. The chest was hurting down the back of my left arm was hurting. And at that point, Karen had gotten up because Wednesday, some of you know, was 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 Shirley's home going. It was a celebration of Shirley's home going. And it was my part to do that service. So I get it. It's about 7 o'clock. We're supposed to be there at the chapel at 9. And I tell Karen what's going on. She said, well, Dad, get in the truck. We're going to the emergency room. I said, I can't do that. And she said, what do you mean you can't do that? I said, I can't do that. I got a service to do. And she said, we aren't going to, we're not going to take a chance with your heart. With your, I said, listen, this ain't, we're not taking a chance. I, God's going to take care of me. Amen. So, but I'm not going to be foolish either. All right. So we get dressed. We head to the chapel. And on the way, I call my doctor and we tell him what's going on. And he says, go to the emergency room, Todd. And I said, well, I'm in the middle of something. It's a true story. And he says, and he says, well, listen, you need to, I'm not telling you to speed there, but you need to go there and don't stop. He said, because that doesn't sound like something to do with your acid reflux. And I said, well, as soon as I can, I'll go. Okay. So we did the service at the chapel. We went to the graveside. I parked my truck up by the road so that I could wouldn't get blocked in. I could get out. I did the service, and as soon as I felt like I could leave without being rude about the whole ordeal, I went and got in my truck, and I drove straight to the hospital in Springfield and spent the next five and a half hours in the emergency room, okay? They drew blood, and they rent, put it, did an EKG, and they put me back in the waiting room, and they drew more blood, and they did the EKG, and they did a couple, two or three of them, 
and throw a whole bunch of blood and finally put me in a hospital bed. And I'm just laying there, and during that time, I start thinking about the battle that it's been. Because I'm going to be honest with you, for about four years, I had zero health challenges, none. It was like God just gave me this respite from it all. And I told I told my doctor, I, was, I felt like I had the GI tract of a 20-year-old. Okay? If you ain't my age, you don't know what I'm talking about. So... So I'm laying there, and I'm thinking about, you know, because the enemy runs a million thoughts through your head. And, you know, the arm thing was new to me. I I had never, that's never been a, that wasn't a symptom six years ago when I dealt with that acid reflux. It wasn't a symptom then. So it was new to me. And so I'm laying there, and the enemy's trying to tell me all kinds of things. And all of a sudden, God starts working on me about perspective, about how, what I think about him, how I look at him, what I think he's going to do in my life and whether or not. And listen, and I shared this with you last week. There is a place in your Bible where there's a miracle that happens. Jesus heals a man's son, and and in that, he makes this statement, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, which is, it seems... It seems like a contradiction, but it isn't a contradiction. What he's saying is, I believe in you. I believe you. I believe you can do all these things, but the enemy's still messing with me, trying to tell me you won't, so please help me. Are you listening? It's a real thing. Most of you, anytime you go to believe something, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Can God do anything? Absolutely he can do anything. Will he do anything? You bet he will do anything. But is he going to this time? And the enemy starts messing. Yeah. So I'm thinking, Lord, I'm I'm laying here and I'm thinking, man, listen, the acid reflux is enough. I've been dealing with that for several weeks. I don't want to deal with some heart issue. Amen. So I'm just laying, and God starts giving me, and he brings this scripture to mind, and then he starts talking to me, and I'm going to show you what he showed me, and I hope it blesses you. Because he starts showing me this, and he takes me to Genesis 1, verse 16. This happened in the waiting room. I want to watch, I'm going to read that to you again. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And when I read that, I said, God, don't have nothing to do with my healing. What are you talking about? I mean, I'm needing some help here, and you're talking about stars. I don't know how God talks to you or even how he deals with you. I'm just telling you that's what happened to me. So I'm, I'm, I, and, and when it first starts, I'm sitting in the waiting room. When God starts, to, so I got my phone on me. I pull it up. I start looking. I start reading, I start trying to connect the dots, and I can't figure out what the dots are. Because I'm pretty sure making the stars don't have anything to do with pain running up and down my left arm. Are you with me? Yeah, I I know. You're God's first cousin. You never get confused about what God's saying. But if you just pray for me that I'll reach the spiritual maturity you have, I won't have these issues anymore. So I'm trying to figure it out. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit, and finally, it's literally, it's back. I get back when they put me in a, in a hospital bed. I'm laying there, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, now, I don't even think he said it or not, but I'm telling you, this is how it works. Google stars. God, I'm not going to Google anything. You know they're of the devil. They have a liberal bent, and I'm not looking nothing up on there. But so I Google stars. Now watch this. So let me read to you, and I just I just pasted and post, you know, just copy and paste the whole thing. So I'm just gonna read it to you. Comes up, our sun is enormous. More than a million earths could fit inside of it. Wow. Is right. But on a stellar scale, it's relatively small. Literally, half of every star out there could swallow up the sun. Especially a star called UY, and I think it's Scooty or Scuddy. I don't know exactly how it's pronounced. I couldn't find the pronunciation online, so whatever it is, UY 
Scuddy. And that's a name that gets the biggest star in the known universe. It's a variable hypergiant with a radius of around 1,700 times larger than the radius of the sun. To put that in perspective, the volume of almost 5 billion suns could fit inside of it. I'm, now watch. Our Milky Way, our best, best estimate, tells us that the Milky Way is made up of approximately 100 billion stars. These stars form a large disk whose diameter is about 100,000 light years. Our solar system is about 25,000 light years away from the center of the galaxy, so basically we live in the suburbs. I put that in. Using the Milky Way as our model, we can multiply the number of stars in a typical galaxy, which is 100 billion, by the number of galaxies that we know about in the universe, which is 2 trillion galaxies. The answer is absolutely astounding. There are approximately 200 billion trillion stars in the universe, or put... Another way, 200 sextillion stars in the known universe. 200 billion trillion stars. And Genesis said, and he made the stars also. You talk about a footnote. That's barely a footnote. In the Hebrew, it's just two Hebrew words. Are you listening? 200 sextillion stars, and God barely mentions it in the creation account. But honey, just a little while later, he talks about mankind, and he gives him five verses, not five words, and he goes on to tell him over and over again, you have dominion. And all of a sudden, perspective starts coming to me, and I start realizing, God, you are a great big God. You are a huge God. You're greater than anything I could think of, and you got this. Now, let me read you. Let me, let, I want to read it to you because I read it to you when you started. I want you to hear this. Watch this. Watch this. Genesis. No, I didn't. Genesis 1. I'll find it. I'm sorry. Genesis 1, 26, verse 30. This is after the stars. Hang with me. This is what God says about man. <laughs> we're not even a speck on the grand scheme of things. Literally. We're not a speck on the earth. Can you imagine the sun and the stars? Five English words. And he also made the stars. Here comes mankind. Honey, this is why animals are not men. This is why we don't create cre creation worship. This is why you better listen to me. Man is the only thing made in the likeness and image of God. Two hundred sectillion stars for your viewership. Watch verse twenty six. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In his image of God created he him. Male and female. Oops, there's two genders. Get mad at God. You can call me a bigot, call God a bigot. He made you. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea. Here we are again, having dominion over animals. You watch TV, you'd think animals and people are equal. 
But then again, when you teach generations of people that they all cry, cry, crawled out of the same primordial slime and became one thing or evolved to be another thing, what difference do they know? You aren't a cosmic accident. You were created in the likeness and image of God. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Perspective. If the enemy can change it on you, your faith will go away. If he can make you think God isn't with you or you're not important, because that's the biggest thing that I've seen in 27 years of ministry is people just don't think they're important. Now listen, the converse of that is when the world teaches you you're more important than you should be. Stay with me. In God's eyes, we are the pinnacle of his creation. Now, the reason I I believe that God showed me this comparison is that when you go back to my text, then if God be for me, who made 200 sextillion, sextillion stars with barely a mention, if that God be for me, who can be against me? I looked up something else while I had time this week because I was curious about it. It depends on which version you read. It's a little different if you read that nearly inspired version, but if you read, you'll get it. Sometimes I call it the trucker's version, but anyways, it's, but, but I started defending truckers, and the reason I called it, it was New International. That's where I got the name, not because I thought truckers don't read the Bible. Now I call it the nearly inspired bird. And here's why. There's a lot of good in there, but it, when it comes to the power of the Holy Ghost, it leaves some things out. It's dangerous. It doesn't like to say what the Bible says. Amen? So that's dangerous. You've got to be careful with that part. But if you look up, what I believe a legitimate, and there's several, it's not just KJV, several legitimate, and there's some that are more on top of the language than KJV is. But in a legitimate translation, you'll find that over 200 times, there's a little phrase in there. It's almost a, I wouldn't call it a cliche. It's almost like a colloquialism in the Word of God. And it is two words, but God. But God, think about it for just a minute. It is a, how do I say it? It is a declaration that God intervenes in the matters and the affairs of man. Let me read something to you. 1 John 2, verse 1. 1 John 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen? Romans 8, verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ who died, yea, rather, who is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who what? Also makes intercession for us. I'll read you Hebrews and then I'll preach in a little bit. We'll be done. Hebrews 6, verse 18 says this that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Verse 19, 
which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Watch this. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. What's it saying? That Jesus went behind the veil to the mercy seat in heaven and anchored a point right there that you have for ne- from now throughout eternity, you have an anchor of your soul. That is your but God because you're going to come up, but God, I don't feel good today. And God says, but me, okay? But God, I, I, we don't, there's not enough money, but God. There's not enough time, but God. There's not enough. Are you listening to me this morning? Every time you come up with your little feeble butts, God will step in and say, how about me? But me. We have an anchor, an advocate. We have somebody that constantly speaks in the heavenlies on your behalf, constantly talks to the Father on your behalf. Honey, it doesn't matter what the devil says he can do or will do. Before he gets to finish what he wants to finish with you, you got a but God that will step in the middle of it all and change all the plans of the enemy. You have... God, and if God be for you, who could be against you? The word just said, I've given it to you. Why are you backing up? Come on, take, come on, receive. I've provided for you. I read it to you in Genesis. Everything you need was provided when God created man. Are you listening? Now, man broke the relationship with God, and later Christ came to restore that and reconcile that. However, here on earth, God gave you dominion. Amen? Dominion. Do you know what that is? To dominate. Listen, I, and, I, and I just, I'm not going to take any time to do this, but I need you to understand this. The, the trend to what I believe is animal worship in, in these last days is is about denying the dominion of man. I'm not talking about being cruel to anything. I'm talking about having, you, you have this domain according to the Bible. And if you're going to believe one part of it, you need to believe that part of it. Amen? You have dominion. And listen, I'm telling you right now, the whole evolutionary project, and that's what it's been, has been to strip man of his dominion. Amen? Let me explain something to you. Man didn't become dominant over this earth because our ancestors figured out how to make a rock knife first. Man became dominant over this earth because in Genesis, when God breathed power and life into his own nostrils, he said, raise them up and give them dominion. Now we have dominion, and if the enemy can change your perspective, he'll change your faith. And if he can change your faith, he'll change your profession. 